Welcome to the midweek edition of Business Morning on Channels Television. Good morning and get set for great business conversations. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Well, just before we delve into that conversation, uh, let's get updates from the space of the global oil space and prices rebounded from sharp losses in the previous session as concerns about tighter supplies from Russia and Libya dominated while industry data shows a drop in U.S. crude inventories last week. Brent crude features rose $0.98 cents to $108.23 a barrel, while the front-month WTI crude features contract, which expires today, rose $0.94 cents to $103.50 a barrel. The second-month contract gained $1.07 to $103.12 a barrel. Analysts believe that risks are still skewed to the upside with the potential for further disruptions from Libya and more importantly, the potential for an EU ban on Russian oil where global oil spaces have been volatile, pulled higher by a tighter supply outlook following sanctions on Russia, which is the world's second largest oil exporter and a key European supplier after its invasion of Ukraine which Moscow calls special operation. However, a softer global economic outlook and ongoing COVID-19 lockdowns in China that have hurt demand in the world's top crude importer are weighing on prices. On the supply side, OPEC Plus produced 1.45 million barrels per day below its production target in March as Russian output began to decline following sanctions imposed by the West. Well, let's come back to Nigeria now and have our first conversation. And it concerns the threat. Uh, vehicle clearing agents are threatening to halt work following the introduction of the National Automobile Commission levy. Vehicles clearing agents uh, say they will close their stores this week. So it's obviously important that we have this conversation and find out from them. Well, it's not a new issue. We've had them on before to talk about the 15% National Automobile Commission levy imposed by the Nigeria Customs Service. We do have uh, to clear the air and tell us uh, the threats and uh, where the plan and way forward. Uh, Dr. Kaede Farinto, he's the acting national president of the Nigeria Licensed Customs Agent joining us. Good morning, uh, Dr. Farinto. Good Thank to you. have you here. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Good morning. So even though not very good situation because you're threatening to down too. I know we've been down this road before yes. where you, you actually that time, I think for about a week or so, yes. there were no clearing of vehicles at the port and exactly. it really cost a lot of chaos. And we're not ready to see that again. Yeah. And it's still about this uh, uh, vehicle levy. Yes. I thought you guys had a meeting with the customs service. Yes, what happened is there was a meeting last week where Nigerian Customs Service called for a stakeholders meeting. And that meeting was as a result of the VIM valuation where we actually complained that uh, the stakeholders were not carried along. So they are trying to dot the T's and cross the I's. So they now invited us, subjected their values to uh, scrutiny. We looked at it. They want our buy-in into the program. It's okay. For now, we have, been, we have advised them on what to do particularly the gray areas on what, what to clear. They, they have not considered the issue of accidented vehicles, salvage vehicles, and all these things must be put into consideration. But this time around, it has to do with National Automotive Council, which was actually slammed on the used vehicles, about 15%. Uh, you guys say it should be only on new vehicles. Yes, that's what the law say. Act, Act number 6 of 2014 spoke about the National Automotive Council, and uh, that act was a, an act of national uh, parliament, and said that uh, NAC will be slammed on fully built imported vehicles or new spare part for vehicles, not on used vehicles. So now that the government is trying to misinterpret the law, there's need for Nigerians to know what is happening. Okay, Incidentally, we were actually in Abuja in that meeting, and the national president of uh, motor dealer was in that meeting, and we did complain about this. Uh, we went to the Ministry of, Federal Ministry of Finance about this particular issue, and up to now, we have not heard anything from them. So Nigerians are not too happy about it, particularly stakeholders. And we also told Nigerian Customs Service, there's need for you to carry along the various stakeholders when issues like this happen, even if it's a directive from the Federal Ministry of Finance, carry us along before implementation, we we'll now know how to tackle it headlong. So that is the issue of uh, NAC. All right, but um, the NCS, the Customs Service, is yeah. saying that this 
is in compliance with the economic community of West Africa common external No, no, tariff. that's far from true. That's not true. If they say it's in compliance from ECOWAS, it is not true. We are privileged to know what is happening in ECOWAS. The ECOWAS now, they are trying to liberalize the scheme and uh, every country that is a signatory to that convention must key into the HS code and the rate of duty. What Nigerian government is trying to do is that before now, duty on vehicles were 35%. But because we are signatory to that convention and they must comply and that is why they need to reverse to 20% on used vehicles. Now, how do we get the other money? Now bringing in the issue of saying all used vehicles now must pay 15% NAC, which is National Automotive Council. And that was not the intention of the law. So government is just trying to be smart by half. And the, 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 when we met Nigerian Customs Service, they gave us a circular, which we actually disseminated and gave to our members. It actually emanated from Nigerian Consul, uh, Nigerian. Federal Ministry of Finance. What they are trying to do, that's what we call import adjustment tax. For every nation that is a producing nation, like, like you are producing uh, vehicle, new vehicle, and you want to protect the local assemblers, then you can now introduce the import adjustment tax so that the local assemblers will be pro produced and protected. However, in the last 10 years that this law has been, this levy has been even collected on new vehicles, we cannot even produce uh, radiator. Let alone, not even light. So it is the law that was actually enacted to enrich some uh, categories of Nigeria and not in the, in the interest of the masses. And that is not too good for uh, our economy. As I talk to you now, in the next four, one or two months, those are our younger youth who are actually going to Uber or buying all these mini small, small vehicles will not be able to afford it again because of the implementation of because the... Because of this uh, uh, commission. Uh, yes, and you this, still have uh, the VIN. Yeah, we still have the VIN. No, the, with the VIN now, the VIN, what we're trying to do on the... What Custom is trying to do on the issue of the VIN is across board, you have a minimum uniform value, which is not too bad. If there's going to be uh, changes, the, 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 the this difference should not be more than maybe 1,000, 2,000, at most 5,000. A situation where in a, a papa port you clear a vehicle and the difference that of Tinkan is running into hundreds of thousands going into the same market, we believe that this is not too good for Nigeria. We as professionals and our importers have been calling us name on this issue and we told them, let us see how we can do this Fashion is in a Ghana system where if you have your consignment, particularly vehicle, the moment you put your VIN uh, chassis, it gives you the duty that you have to pay. No customer officer will not stop those vehicle on the road. If you see what is happening in our seaport now, as soon as our members even manage to leave the seaport, we still have various custom unit formation slamming and uh, intercepting these same vehicles and consignment that have been cleared from our seaport. That's not too good for our environment. And that's why we say, let us see a better system that will at least help the industry. And okay. that was why the VIN valuation came on board. But the okay. issue of a NAC is not, a, is not an ECOWAS thing. Whoever is telling you ECOWAS is just trying to be very, very funny. Okay, it is so a this, federal this, government this thing. These threats of no. uh, halting work, yeah. um, we've been through it before and it mm. was not a pleasant experience. It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, when was the plan? Are you talking to... Yeah, if, if not that we have been pacifying our youth, by now they will have closed down the port because we, they feel it and we also feel what they feel because we are actually going to the same market and we know what is... And most of the fact that uh, it's, not, it's not even easy to get a bill of lading. But what we're trying to say is that the last time we closed on the port, over 700 million naira were, were be paid in terms of demurrages and storage, which is not the port of the importer, nor the port of the freight forwarder. Ideally, in a normal climb, Nigerian Customs Service should be giving an uh, apology to the whole Nigerians and I'm paying that money. But because Nigeria anything goes, it's very, very unfortunate. We are still in Banana Republic. So we're not trying to tell our members, for now, let the strike be the last resort. As I talk to you now, we are going to host the various motor dealers association for another I mean, dialogue tomorrow. After that, we will now move to Abuja. If government now refuses to listen, there will be a one-day warning strike. After that, there will be a total close down of the port, and not in the western zone alone. It's going to be across the country because it is not about the issue of even NAC alone. We are now going to bring the issue of arbitrary jackup on par and many other issues that have been militating against uh, cargo clearance in the port, which are barriers to trade. We will now bring it to the front burner and close down all the ports. But for now, we are still negotiating. We are still talking about members that let that one be our last resort because closing that report in view of what is happening post-COVID-19 
and uh, the fact that Nigeria import is actually uh, economy is import dependent, we think that for now it is too early to talk about strike. But it's, as it is going, if government refuses to listen, there will be a one day warning strike. Then before we now close down the whole port. When you talk about uh, government, are you talking of the customs service? No, no, not customs. It's the Federal Ministry of Finance. Federal Ministry of Finance is the supervisory ministry of customs. Whatever customs does is actually an, uh, a kind of a directive from the Federal Ministry of Finance. When I was actually blaming them, they brought out the circular and we circulated to our member. The circular was signed by the Honorable Minister of Finance herself and it was dated 7th of April. For implementation. It is unfortunate that they are misinterpreting the law. Section 10 of this law said that there will be 2% of cost insurance and freight on imported newer vehicles or imported new spare parts for motor vehicles and not new vehicles. All right, uh, just before we let you go now, uh, uh, tell us, paint for us the picture. Yeah. If yeah. this, uh, with or without this 15% yeah. uh, now, yeah. paint for us. Um, an average cost, yeah. you know, of clearing a vehicle yeah. at this time. Yeah, no, you know, no, let me say this, that uh, if VIN is now introduced, don't forget there's a law that talks about the fact that only 10, 10 years of vehicles that can come in, 15 years of truck can come in or buses. So if this, with the implementation of this new 15% uh, uh, NAC now, we're going back to the era of 35%. It's not far from it. And what ECOWAS want to achieve is to see a situation where trade will be liberalized, duties will be reduced, and if you want to even protect the local assemblers, then you can now start talking about all new vehicles, not new vehicles. I take, I, I take it from whether you like it or not, the rate of smuggling will increase in the next uh, one or two weeks. And it's unfortunate that uh, vehicles that were clearing maybe for uh, one million naira before now will not just go to about 1.6 million naira. And that's why I say all those our youth that are buying the Toyota Corollas, the Toyota Avensis for Uber may not be able to afford it again. It's very, very unfortunate. This is happening. All right. Uh, we, well, we do appreciate the fact that you're still having conversations with the government. We'll certainly follow, stay on this story and hope that uh, you know uh, eventually it's balanced both for the Ministry of Finance and uh, for the clearing agents and the youths out there that you're talking about. Thank you so much, uh, you. Dr. Kaede Farinto, Acting you. National President of Nigeria Licensed Customs Agents. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. All right. So we'll have a second conversation in just a moment. But before that, uh, we've been hearing downgrading of uh, growth by IMF, by the IMF, by the World Bank. Uh, this time around, we have the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, slashing its forecast for global economic growth for the second time this year. And it's not far from the war going on in Ukraine. The IMF says that it now projects global growth of 3.6%. Uh, it dropped from 0.4% that it was. The global lender has also raised its forecast for Nigeria's economic growth. Uh, that's a, a rare one at this time. Uh, in 2022, it's been raised to 3.4%. That's because of the increase in prices of crude oil globally. As we know, Nigeria, of course, uh, has its own quota to produce to the world when it comes to that. Well, according to IMF chief economist, the war is expected to slow growth and further increase inflation. Global economic prospects have been severely set back, largely because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This crisis unfolds as the global economy has not yet fully recovered from the pandemic. Even before the war, inflation in many countries had been rising due to supply-demand imbalances and policy support during the pandemic, prompting a tightening of monetary policy. The growth outlook for the European Union has been revised downward by 1.1 percentage points due to the indirect effects of the war, making it the second largest contributor to the overall downward revision. The war adds to the series of supply shocks that have struck the global economy in recent years. Like seismic waves, its effect will propagate far and wide through commodity markets, trade, and financial linkages. Russia is a major supplier of oil, gas, and metals, and together with Ukraine, of wheat and corn. Reduced supplies of these commodities have driven their prices up sharply.
Well, now to the next topic on the agenda, the House of Representatives has passed for second reading a bill to establish a regulatory framework for tech start startups in Nigeria. The startup bill is set to position Nigeria's startup ecosystem as a leading digital technology center in Africa by providing enabling environment for the growth of startups, guard against different challenges faced by startups, and bring a whole lot more into that system and attract even more talents. Well, we have to follow up. We've had this conversation a couple of times, but uh, since it's gone through second reading now, let's put our eyes on it. And we're doing that with a startup attorney. He's Omori Edogiawere joining us this Thank morning. You. Good Thank to you, see Andy. you, Omori. Thank you. So, um, well, this is not, uh, 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 this, this has received a lot of applause. So a lot of people yeah. are excited about it. That is going to bring a framework to the ecosystem. What are you expecting from this startup bill? Well, like you said, it is um, going to help provide a, a, a positioning for not just startups in Nigeria, but for Nigeria as a leader in the startup ecosystem in the region. We, we cannot afford to just be the most populous nation. We have got to set direction and set the pace. Um, I would even say that we're coming late to the party. Um, a couple of jurisdictions that have our numbers and uh, level of economic growth have already put in place incentives and uh, measures to help propel startups. So, yes, we're late to the party, but we're better late party than never. Anyway. Yes, we're here already. Yeah, but, uh, okay, so one of the things that I notice is it's trying to protect, um, for instance, there's uh, the section that says that uh, employees will have a tax holiday for two, two years. years. And so it's trying to bring in skills and also to protect them. But, um, the thing with Nigeria is not about the policy, it's not about the bills, it's about the implementation. You know, for instance, we have the Petroleum uh, uh, the petroleum Industry Bill, Industry bill Act Acts now, now yes. you know, which has been signed. And then when we come to the implementation, we're talking of subsidy, and then we now have to postpone, and then maybe we're looking at... So it's about the implementation. That's actually kind of reduces the excitement or expectation, you know, from, from bills like this? Well, the uniqueness of this bill is that it, although it's a government bill, it has gone through a series of consultations. And actually, the industry players are actively involved in the process, both the regulators, both the players in the ecosystem, and government and now the legislature are making their inputs. The idea around this is to have everyone make meaningful input. So what you have now is fragmented regulation. So the idea is to have a big tent approach. And so where you have a big tent approach, it brings everybody in. It's easier to implement. It's actually more impactful because whatever information is lost or whatever ambiguities that are lost with um, uh, fragmented implementations are resolved when you have a unified front. So bring everybody together. That's why you're going to have the National Council of, on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And the idea um, of the council is to provide oversight, lay out a harmonized regulatory framework, provide oversight. And this council will consist not just government, but also industry players who are in the startup ecosystem. You need to understand that startups, just like the word is, start up. Mm -hmm. They are the formative stage of building innovative products. And so they need all the support they can get. Uh, innovation and technology is taking over. Whether you like it or not, it's coming to take you. And so you must be prepared. Now, there's the need to give those at the center stage an enabling environment, a system where they can adequately thrive, right? I provide legal oversight to a lot of startups. And one of the issues that they have is fragmented rules so you really don't know where you're getting this from you really don't know who who has this oversight you are not even sure if there is a law regulating what you're doing and so this is going to bring everything that's together, why i said a big tent co approach coordinated yes. and all that now let's paint a picture i like to do reality mm -hmm. um in nigeria you have um the bulk of act of uh, activities in the informal sector 
Mm -hmm. So even in startups, you have more in, in the informal sector. What should attract the people in the informal sector? I mean, as you noted, there are startups. They're just there. It's just a young man, a young woman who just wants to start something small, probably on his phone, you know, doing the uh, online sales and, you know, moving from there and growing uh, or, pro or offering software services. Building apps. Yeah, software services and all of that. Why should they be captured? Because once you come to be captured, then you'll be told to pay fees, fines, no. get your license. You, so, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so, so I hear you, but it's important that we also realize that Thriving in any environment must come with some regulation. And that regulation also brings protection. Why does government say pay your tax? They pay your tax so we can give you roads, hospitals, and the likes, and, and everything. Let's not go into other issues. But the point is, for instance, the bill proposes to have a startup portal. The idea around that startup portal is to have a one-size-fix-all where startups can go in and avail themselves of the licenses, the regulations, whatever issues they have, and also assess funding. So, like you said, those small businesses, the biggest problem an entrepreneur or a startup owner has is funding. And while government provides regulation, government also has a solid capacity to provide funding, has a solid capacity to provide interest-free loans, or with, with loans with very reduced rates, interest rates. And these are the things that will propel startups. So in addition to creating an enabling environment, which is the fundamental thing for such regulation, it's also to provide the support that these small businesses need, that small tech developer who has an innovative, mind-breaking product that could be a game changer, needs the support of Government, for instance, you know, there's going to be the startup fund that they can assess through the NSIA, you know, mm. and get some loans that will help propel them to grow. So the, in the, the idea around coming under the umbrella is to provide not just regulation, but support. But support. support that will propel meaningful growth and impact. How close are we to getting this uh, bill assented to? Well, Lawyer, well, well, at least. <laughs> well, 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 it has passed second reading, yes. and so far so good. It's, it's, it's been welcomed very well. Mm. Uh, because really, let's be honest, technology, digitization, innovation is coming to take the center stage, and we have got to be prepared. One way of being prepared is to have a law that will help propel that. All right. Uh, Omori Edogarere, a startup attorney, thank you so much. This is an ongoing conversation. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure when it goes me. to the next stage, we'll have you again. Definitely. Help us dissect Definitely. and convince the informal sector to embrace Definitely. this. Definitely. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ine. So after the break, Apex Commodities Market is up next. We'll find out what happened in that market week on week. This is Business Morning on Channel Television. You're welcome back. Well, a sea of red on the Apex commodity market. Uh, that's the summary for the weekend at the 18th of April with a total turnover and volume down by more than 90% week on week. Well, we have Michael Martins now joining us from our Abuja studio. Michael Martins, portfolio manager at Apex. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Let's have a rundown of the market activities for the week. Hi, Ine. Good morning. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. To um, so you. just to give you a summary of what happened on the exchange in the week under consideration, um, the total turnover uh, of all transactions of the exchange fell by more than 92% um, from 9.63 billion to close to trading week at 0.68 billion. Uh, the total number of contracts also fell by 92.44% from 34.92 million contracts to close to trading week at just 2.64 million contracts. The number of deals also fell by 50.51% from 480 
37 deals to close the trading week at 241 deals. The Apex Commodities Index, which is the ACI, went up slightly by 0.19% um, from 485.32 points to close the trading week at 486.23 points. However, we saw a slight decrease in the Apex Export Index, which fell by 0.17% from 205.65 points to close the week at 205.30 points. Uh, with regards to the volume of contracts traded in the week on a consideration, we generally saw a decline with the major biggest changes um, you know, happening with Maze, which fell from 13.16 million contracts to trade just 1.91 million contracts this week, and also Soybean, which fell from 2.4 million contracts to trading just over 448,000 contracts. Um, all other commodities also traded less this week in comparison to the previous week, uh, with Ginger and Sesame trading little to not volume at all. Uh, with regards to price changes on the exchange, uh, there was a general increase across board uh, with May Cashew not rather having the biggest change uh, going up by 11.8% to close the trading week at 702.38 Naira per kilogram. Uh, we also have Sogum go up by 9.80% to close the trading week at 249 Naira 21 Koba per kilogram. Paddy Rice also went up by 5.40% to close the trading week at 249 Naira 21 Koba per kilogram. Uh, soybean also went up by 3.90% to close the trading week at over 400 Naira. Um, however, we saw slight decreases with cocoa, which fell by 2.75% to close the trading week at just over 1,200 Naira per contract. Maize also fell slightly by 1.28% to close the trading week at just over 230 Naira per kilogram. Um, so those are largely the, the price changes and also volume changes that we saw take place on the exchange of the week under consideration. And as we always mention, if you want to know more about the commodities market, you can always go to our website, which is www.afxnigeria.com. Or you can download our app if you want to get started trading commodities, which is available on iOS and also on Android. All right, Michael, just before we let you go, it's planting season and then the war in Ukraine is still there with all of the effects. Uh, what impact is this having on trading on your exchange? Um, I mean, not a lot, right? Um, so most of the dynamics that we're seeing playing out with fertilizer prices now, we would not see their effect until the you know uh, you know the new harvest season what we are noting however is the fact that the high fertilizer prices right because if you look at it on a global level i mean that has been going up week on week and even in you know even in nigeria currently the prices are up more than 40 50 and even 60 percent in some cases so we are having higher than normal fertilizer prices and that's going to significantly affect um you know how much uh, fertilizers the average small older farmers can buy in order for them to be able to cultivate considering that we are actually implanting you know, considering that we are actually in planting season. Um, should that subsist, then we're going to see uh, a significant food shortage uh, at, at harvest. And that is going to transfer into higher commodity prices across board and also higher finished products. Um, I think it's safe to say that we do need a bit, uh, you know, in the way of a subsidy program to sort of help the average small older farmer, you know, be able to purchase as much fertilizer as possible for him to be able to cultivate. Because without that, um, so let me explain what that means. Fertilizer prices have doubled, but it is not the case that the farmer's income has doubled. So there's a big disparity on that front. And if that disparity is, is, is not addressed, then we're going to have a, a big problem with food shortages and also high commodity prices and final products too. All right, Michael Martin, thank you so much for that insight. Uh, we move on to another conversation now still with Apex. Apex is announcing the third edition of its industry events, Code Cash Crop, which brings together three sectors of technology, finance, and agriculture. Code Cash Crop aims to serve as an important hub for conversation on some of the most impactful issues around agriculture and how intersection of the three sectors can impact the most significant problems in the food systems in Nigeria. Well, to have that conversation, we have uh, Yusuf Obuntola. He's the chief tech officer at Apex, uh, also joining us from Abuja. Hello, Mr. Obuntola. Good morning. Good to have you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Apex is announcing this uh, third edition of its uh, Code Cash Crop event. Uh, what are the expectations from this event? Um, so the third version of Code Cash Crop, which is happening this year, um, is going to happen in three core stages. Um, today, um, almost immediately now, people can immediately go onto our website, africaexchange.com, and um, start submitting 
their entries for the program. Our expectation is that people would come in in teams. And um, if you look at what the name of the um, program is, Code Cash Crop, it is largely bringing together three key sectors of the economy that, that um, seldom interact. Um, that is technology, finance, and agriculture. So as an organization, one of the things that we've done is to be at the front burner of bringing um, these three key sectors together. Code Cash Crop is bringing, giving the opportunity for these three um, key sectors to interact. So we expect that people would form teams um, largely from these three key sectors. So one team would be composed of three different people, someone from finance, someone from tech, someone from agriculture, and then we have each of these teams go on and register on our website. And we'll be shortlisting um, 10 from all of the submissions at the end of the day and um, the program would then be happening within two core locations, Kano and Ibado. So, and then that's, so that's when we then move to the next stage of the program. The next stage of the program is the hackathon. The hackathon is where each participant or each team would then be um, logging heads together, would then be competing and be building the idea that they've submitted in the um, entry submission stage. At the end of the hackathon, we'll be picking two best teams from each of these locations who would then be the ones pitching their idea during the grand finale in Lagos, um, hopefully on the 1st of June, 2022. So what are the requirements for participants? The expectation is that whoever is going to be coming up um, to participate in Code Cash Crop are experts within th these three key sectors, right? Because what we intend to achieve is to see how can we use technology to disrupt agricultural trade infrastructure. So we believe that the answer to this question would best be answered by experts from agriculture, um, finance, and um, agri uh, technology. So we need experts from these three key sectors to form a team and they would then be the one proposing ideas that they believe would be the next disruptive idea for the sector and then be the one building out that idea using the platform that we are going to be providing for them. So that means from your explanation, each participant is a group of three people at least. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay, However, right. we'll be mm -hmm. given the opportunity for individuals to also register on the website if they already haven't formed a team we would then be looking at the location they are registering from and their expertise in the field. There's a field for them to fill in their expertise there. We would, be, we would then be grouping them into teams if they already do not have a team. Okay, so um, individuals can, a single, in their, uh, individually can still um, register for it. Correct. Okay, Correct. cool. All right, so what are the benefits uh, that uh, AFEX hopes to achieve and um, what are the benefits also to participants of uh, the hackathon? So apart from the fact that the winner of the hackathon would be going home with a cash price of 2.5 million, and they would also have their um, details and the idea that they are going to be building, publicized across all of our channels, and, be, and have the opportunity of building on um, the sophisticated platforms that FX already has. I think it's one very fantastic thing for them to note that they are not just going to be building technology or building ideas for building sake. They are building something that would impact the lives of smallholder farmers. They are building um, stuff that would impact the economy of the country. And then at the end of the day, it will then fit into the larger bucket of helping Africa feed itself, which is the core mission of AFEX as an organization. So apart from uh, Hackathon, how else uh, can tech help to increase financing in agriculture? If you look at the reason why we've had, we've had largely um, a great deficit in financing in agriculture um, around the world, one of the key um, challenges, one of the key factors is, is because um, whoever is providing finance, right, want to see where is my money going into. They want to be sure, is there a um, transparent channel for me to actually monitor the disbursement of this fund? And can I actually see the output 
and be able to confirm that this is what I'm getting, this is what my money is translating into at the end of the day. So when technology comes into the picture, it gives everyone the transparent platform for them to be able to, one, know where they are going to be uh, planting, their, planting their money into, see how the fund is being used, and then also be able to see the outcome of this um, fund that they are also disbursing out, which is one terrain that um, FX has always been in. We've built uh, different platforms that makes it easy for investors to be able to um, invest their money and then see that money grow and then be able to monitor the investment that they have transparently. So uh, finally, uh, Daniel, tell us the dates when you know this event is on, when people can participate, can um, um, uh, sign up for it, you know, and when it ends. Thank you. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, people can immediately go onto our website now and um, start submitting their entries. Entry submission would end by the 38th of April, and um, by the 4th of May, we'll be announcing the shortlisted teams for the hackathon. Uh, the hackathon would be happening week on week on, in the different locations that I've mentioned between the week of the um, 9th to 11th of May and the following week. We'll be having the hackathon in Kano and um, Le and Ibadan. Um, this information would also be available on our website, and there would also be a Q&A channel for people who have more questions um, about this information, um, the, the, the hackathon, on our website as well. So all of this, after happening, will then um, um, finally lead them to the grand finale, which will then be happening on the 1st of June in Lagos. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yusuf Ogunsola, Chief Tech Officer at Apex, and we wish you all the best Thank you for uh, having me. in your program. Welcome back. Uh, that was the Apex time. Now we head to the market with Aniti Edit. Aniti, over to you. Yes. Uh, good morning, Ini. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, the market, it's still, it, they resumed from the Easter break and it's still on a bullish ride. The green color is still what the market has been able to maintain from the 1.99% which it closed the week. So we happen to have opened this uh, new week, the third week of April, with another optic. There you have it, 0.07% is what the index printed out at the close of Tuesday's trading session, which translates to about uh, 19 billion naira in total market value, uh, which currently stands at uh, 25.632 trillion naira. And that came on the back of gains from 21 equities, the likes of Stambic IBTC, the likes of Guinness, the likes of um, First Bank, uh, FBN, FBN Holdings. So that's what drove the market further into uh, positive territory. And then, of course, we also had a mixed... Um, um, uh, uh, performance at the sectoral, in terms of sectoral performance. But for the, vol for the volume, value, and deals, the value was up 76.93%, 7, but volume was down by 5.12% at 365.4 million units in contrast to what we had the previous uh, session, which was on Friday. Then the number of deals was also down by 6.75%. Then if you take a look at the top trades, the likes of Fidelity, in terms of vo volume, it accounted for the highest volume turnover. Uh, the, the volume turnover was, um, was at 33.76 million units, while MTN Nigeria, which also appears as the top, uh, top traded uh, equity in terms of volume, was the most uh, traded equity. It, it accounted for the highest um, number of um, the value. It was um, at 4.72 billion at the close of Tuesday's trading session. So that's it for that market. Let's move over to the smaller unlisted securities market. It had gained, the previous week, it had gained about 54.4 billion naira. So, but at the close of Tuesday's trading session, this is how it turned out. Uh, investors did a bit of a profit taking there, which pulled the market index, uh, well, by 
just almost about a quarter of a percent, 0.21 percent, and then the market cap is at 1.02 billion, which is what you see here. In terms of the volume, value, and deals, it was not too much of um, uh, activity. It was um, kind of like a, a pullback. So that's it for that smaller unlisted securities market. Let's flip over to the fixed income market. The fixed income market, it, well, for the for the bonds market, it tilted to uh, a slightly um, bullish side. But in terms of um, the OMO, as well as the Treasury bills market, it was quiet. Uh, average yield there closed at 3.3%, uh, uh, while average yield at OMO segment closed at 3.7%. But for the CBN bills, this is how it turned up. So that's it for the market. We look forward to how it turns out at the close of middle trading session. Yeah, thank you so much, Anita. The fixed income market has been quiet for a while, but mm. we do hope uh, in May we're expecting some liquidity that will change. Thank you so much for that update. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to London, our London studios. Do stay with us. This is Business Morning on Channel Television. <laughs> Hey, welcome back. Western nations are preparing to stage coordinated workouts and other diplomatic snobs to protest against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. At today's meeting, there's a G20 finance ministers, which is holding in Washington, the United States. Uh, let's find out the UK stance with Juliana joining us from our London studio. Hello, Juliana. Good morning. Uh, well, some people are saying that it should actually be Russia being excluded and not that countries will be boycotting the meetings. Uh, good morning. Yes, it's a, a very. It's going to be a very interesting couple of days in Washington when G20 finance ministers gather, and that's because, of course, uh, we know that since the last meeting, uh, there's been this um, horrific war in Ukraine, which has seen uh, the devastating loss of thousands of civilians, as well as uh, sending uh, food and uh, fuel prices skyrocketing. Now, yesterday, Moscow did confirm that their finance minister will be uh, leading a Russian delegation, and that's the reason reason why we've heard from some significant uh, players saying that uh, they're going to boycott. Uh, they won't be attending all of uh, the meetings, most notably as the U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen. I, I believe she will be at an opening plenary uh, today because, of course, they are going to be talking about Russia. Uh, but any other meeting uh, that uh, Russia will be attending, she won't be there. And likewise, too, uh, we've had the same message uh, from the British Finance uh, Minister or Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Rishi Shunak, who's just uh, flown into Washington. And it does raise some concerns about the future of the G20 because, of course, this isn't the G7. Uh, the G20 has other uh, notable players such as India, China, Indonesia, who I believe are the presidential hosts uh, this time around. And they don't believe um, in the same kind of rhetoric about Russia that Western allies do. Uh, uh, believe in. Um, Germany mentioned yesterday that there won't be a final communique or uh, this um, a memorandum um, of understanding which we'd expect in a gathering uh, such as this. But we'll just have to wait and see. Of course, there are clearly some significant uh, global uh, policies that need to be discussed. But as we can see now, uh, the world is not in agreement about a way forward. Yeah, obviously not. And then in other matters, uh, how can people be protected from fake reviews? Uh, we see firms, they say, are caught buying five-star Google review. Juliana, what have you heard about this? Well, yeah, this is part of, um, there's new legislation uh, that the British government are trying to put through uh, Parliament this week. And it's all about uh, really uh, making sure consumer protection uh, stays um, up to a pace uh, with the rapid uh, digital e-commerce uh, sector. We know that fake reviews have been an issue uh, for years and years, but now uh, the consumer minister wants to make sure that the Competition and Markets Authority um, has enough uh, power to make sure people pay for writing fake reviews. According to some studies, 97% of individuals rely on a review before uh, they make a purchase. I believe last year in this country, £23 billion pounds of goods was purchased because of um, a review. Uh, but uh, studies have shown that most of them are fake. Um, Trustpilot, Amazon um, and other kind of online uh, spaces um, seem to have been encouraging this, uh, which is why now uh, the government are hoping it will be a criminal 
will um, it will it will be against the law and a criminal offence for somebody to post a fake review, and you could actually get a long-term prison sentence. And also, there could be fines uh, for websites that host fake reviews. So it's it's a general crackdown on uh, this online scamming review uh, website. About time, some people would say. Yeah, about time, Julian. About time, because a lot of us actually depend on that review to make some choices. Thank you so much for that update, Julian. I will talk to you at 1.30. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. So let's move to the crypto space now. Ladi, how's the market looking this morning? Well, uh, in it's uh, still uh, fear in the market at 27 points, uh, looking at the market sentiment. You know, but we did see, you know, sell-offs, you know, global uh, FTS market. Uh, but we see the crypto market is still, you know, staying a, a little strong. We're seeing Bitcoin there hovering, you know, around that 40K level. Uh, market cap there is up by 1.84%. That's $1.92 uh, trillion. And we see the... Uh, volume traded is down this morning, down about 7%. Uh, Bitcoin dominance sits at 40.94%. And we see uh, Bitcoin holding up there, $41,404. It did fall as low as uh, 38000 uh, That was on, on Monday. Uh, but we're getting, uh, we got a quick reversal on that price. It's now trading up about 1.61% this morning. Uh, volume traded in Bitcoin, $24.61 uh, billion. And we see Ethereum there still uh, holding up. Above that uh, critical $3,000 support, that's uh, up by 1.77%. And we see volume traded $13.14 uh, billion. It's quite um, green on the top of my market cap. We've both seen uh, XRP there down about 0.06%, uh, marginally down, but still within that $0.70 cent, uh, range, holding up uh, not too bad. You know, with that SEC uh, 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 meeting, uh, SEC uh, still have... You know, a lot of uh, cases against XRP talking about, you know, them manipulating the price. Uh, but we're seeing uh, uh, XRP not uh, reacting too well because traders are a little, a little sell-off, you know, on that uh, count of XRP. But we see BNB there, that's up about 1.34% uh, and Cardano uh, up by 1.85%. All right, let's uh, go to uh, Amari Sachet now, uh, creator of eCast. Join us right there from France. Uh, great to have you, Amari. Good hey, morning. great to be here. Great to have you. So, you know, there's been this, uh, you know, debate, you know, about uh, Bitcoin, you know, lo losing that peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash uh, mandate that Satoshi you know, gave it, and you know, we see a lot of people talking about. Oh, uh, we see eCash has that uh, price uh, advantage. You know, trading at less than a cent. But before you, what is the fix? You know, for Bitcoin. Yeah. So exactly, when Bitcoin was created, uh, it was meant to be used as peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. And what that means is that you know, when you go into a shop and you buy something and you pay cash. Uh, the transaction just involved you and the shop owner. Nobody else is involved there. But when you do payment digitally, there is always a third party that is involved. It may be like Visa, MasterCard, your bank, uh, whatever that is, there is always a third party. And it was a technological problem for many years. But uh, with the invention of Bitcoin, it was possible for two parties to transact directly. But what is happening over the past few years is that Bitcoin has become very successful. And with that success, a lot of people started using Bitcoin and Bitcoin did not scale very well. And so transaction time becomes slow, transaction fee become high. And so Bitcoin is not really usable as a digital cash anymore. And this is where we come in. Uh, we have uh, implemented various improvements uh, for scalability, so we cannot build way more transactions than Bitcoin. So the fee remained low, transaction time remained very fast. And at the end of the month, we're going to uh, deploy a new technology called Avalanche that's going to even uh, speed up even more the transaction time. Yeah, it's all about, you know, transaction time is the battle for, you know, how many transactions, you know, per second, you know, in, in the crypto space. But, you know, there's also that talk about, you know, regulation that, uh, you know, came to be last year and it's also seeping into this year. But, you know, some parties are talking about self-regulation, you know, in the crypto space. You know, you're, you're a player there. What, what kind of conversations are you having about self-regulation? 
Yeah, I think the space is a bit too lenient with scams, and as a result, there are a lot of scams. And because there are a lot of scams, that the regulators want to come in and uh, you know deal with that to protect people. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's better for the industry to you know pull together um, and and handle that by itself because the regulator does have the best interest of the industry um, in mind in general, right? And plus, complying with regulation always is. Uh, something that's going to slow down the industry, slow down the innovation. Um, so it's probably better for the industry to, you know, self-regulate a bit more. Um, that's that's going to avoid the, the, you know, actual regulator from stepping in, which is a good thing. Yeah. And, you know, when we look at cryptocurrencies, you know, some people feel like, you know, the people behind these cryptocurrencies are robots, you know, but they're actually people, you know, like you behind this uh, yeah. cryptocurrency. But I'm wondering, you know, without you, can your platform still run? Oh, yes. The platform is is a protocol, right? Uh, it doesn't depend on me specifically. Um, anyone can run a node. And as long as someone is willing to run a node, people can transact and, and that works. Great. All right. Amari Sashe, it was great having you uh, on Business Morning. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right, now, so uh, looking at the top balls, we're seeing uh, Cardano there. That's uh, up by 1.85%. Looking at the top five gainers, we're seeing double-digit gains in the market, uh, but it's still a, quite a fearful market at this point. You know, uh, Bitcoin is still, you know, quite volatile, but we're seeing a couple of gains there with ApeCoin there. That's up 24%. And uh, the move to earn uh, platform there, GMT, that's up about 10% this morning. We see Aave, $184. Uh, that's up about 10.03%. We see the... Uh, losers counter is quite lean. We're seeing single-digit losses this morning with Decred there. Uh, that's topping uh, the counter down by 5%. And we have a XMR, the uh, Monero, the uh, privacy token, there. that's down 2.16%. Audio, $1.35, that's also down 1.84%. Uh, uh, so, any you know, uh, uh, cryptocurrency creators are actually real people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're real people. <laughs> someone created it, someone thought of it, and then brought it, you know, to yeah, life. Yeah, not and some alien, you know, somewhere <laughs> that just, you know, deployed a yes. node. Yeah. Yeah, you know, sometimes when you think of the high-tech things and, you know, the modern stuff, you, you think, or the ITs, you think it, it happens on its yeah, own. Yeah, some right? higher technology somewhere. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ladin. But we have to remind you, our viewers, that Channels Television does not encourage you or market any form of cryptocurrency we just report the markets bring you information from the market and it's up to you if you want to make that choice we don't have any trading platform so please uh, let that be out there well that's our program for today do remember 1 30 business and corporate will be here it will be another interesting uh, and informative time uh, from the business world that'll be at 1 30 tomorrow i'll be back here for another fresh episode of Business Morning. Do enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Ini John Mekwa.